We've spent this past year looking into various Bible characters. With all the characters we've looked at, however, we missed the most important character until now. Because today we're going to begin an extensive series into the life of Christ. And let's face it, he is the reason that we live and breathe. He's the reason that we are gathered here together today. He is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lion and the Lamb, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He is our all in all. He's the light of the world. He's the great shepherd. He's the true vine. Amen? Amen. And I could go on and on and on, and we will this year. But this isn't just going to be an extensive history lesson into the life of Christ. See, first of all, I want to show you that there are some very important reasons to study the life of Christ. <clears throat> some very important reasons why we need to study this. First of all, we need to know who we're following, right? That only makes sense. We need to, to, to submit to and follow him. How can we do that if we don't even know who he is? Philippians 3.10, for example, Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Paul says, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We need to know everything we can about the one who has changed our lives forever. Amen? Amen? Second reason why we need to study this is that we need to grow in love with him. We need to grow in love with him. See, our relationship with Christ cannot be just head knowledge. It needs to be heart knowledge. We need to grow in love with him every day. John 14, 21 Jesus says, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. So we need to discover and obey his commands in order to truly love him and be loved by him. Ephesians 3.17 says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, how many would like to see that in their life? Yeah. yeah. Philippians 1.9, Paul says, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So we need to grow in love with Jesus every day. That's why we need to study who he is. A third reason why we need to study the life of Christ, and that is that we need to grow in our likeness of him. We need to grow in Christ's likeness. We need to become more like him because that's, what a disciple is, right? A disciple is an apprentice, a student who desires above all else to become like his master. We need to desire to become more like Christ. Mark 1.17, Jesus says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. John 15.5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Second Corinthians 3.18 is not in your outline, but I want to read this passage to you here. Listen to 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness, his image, with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 
That's what we need to be doing. We need to, to continually reflect his glory. We need to grow in our likeness of him. In fact, we cannot be his disciples if we don't seek to imitate and reflect him in every area of our life. What a disciple is. So we need to study the life of Christ to grow in our likeness of him. And then last but not least, we need to study this to show others who he is. We need to show others who he is. Because again, this is not just about us, is it? It's about a world that desperately needs the cure for sin. It's about a world that desperately needs to know Jesus. Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is a passage you should be familiar with. Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's what disciples are commanded to do, isn't it? We're commanded to go and make other disciples. So we need to know who we're following. We need to grow in love with him. We need to grow in our likeness of him. And we need to show others who he is. See, this series may very well be the most important study you will ever take. So are you ready to dig in to the life of Christ? I hope so. I hope you come hungry. Are you ready to have your life changed as a result of studying the life of Christ? Well, then let's pray and we'll dig in. Father, we come to you in that precious name of Jesus. The name that is above all names. The name to whom we surrender and submit and bow. We come to you in the name of Jesus and we pray that you would teach us. As we, your students, your disciples, sit around your feet. Would you speak your truth to us this morning? Would you challenge us, encourage us, convict us, whatever it is we need? Would you have free reign in us to mold us and make us more like you? Father, once again, we, we come and we sit at your feet. And we say, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And pray this in that matchless name, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to begin our study in the life of Christ by looking at a subject that on the surface is not very exciting. How many of you like reading genealogies in scripture? Anyone? Yeah, I don't see any hands. Yeah. All those names that we can't pronounce, we just kind of gloss over. Well, my hope today is to convince you that there is great value even in the genealogies in Scripture. Because you see, as we begin the life of Christ, we need to understand where he came from, humanly speaking. And we know he is the Son of God. If you haven't discovered that yet, you will. But we also need to know his human lineage, where he came from, humanly speaking. Now, you need to also understand that genealogies in biblical times were very, very important. That's why the scripture has a lot of them. You see, they established a person's heritage, their inheritance, their legitimacy, their, their citizenship, their rights. The genealogies in scripture were very much like a birth certificate. Now, what can you do without a birth certificate today? Not much. Can't get a job, can't get insurance and license and all that. That's what genealogies were in those days. They were very important. And we find Jesus' genealogy in Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 3. We're going to look first of all at Matthew 1, if you would turn there, please. Matthew chapter 1, if you're using the Pew Bible, you'll find it on page 1373. And we're going to see, first of all, that Matthew's genealogy teaches us that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Jesus is the king of the Jews. That was Matthew's intent when he wrote the gospel. 
He wanted to, to show the Jews that Jesus Christ is the rightful king. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. But to do that, Matthew, first of all, had to prove that Jesus was the rightful heir, that he was a direct descendant of David. And we need to understand as we look at this list in Matthew 1, that it's not all inclusive. He does not include every ancestor here. He only selects key people. In fact, if you jump down to verse 17, we see that he deliberately chose to name only 14 generations during three time periods. Verse 17 of Matthew 1 says, thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to Christ. Now in truth, there were probably more, but he only lists these. Now, we're not sure why he only chose 14. Maybe it was just uh, to keep the pattern. Some uh, scholars believe it made the list easier to memorize. And yes, they memorized genealogies back then. How'd you like to do that? Hmm. But notice also, as we look at this, that Jesus' lineage goes through Joseph, but it doesn't include Joseph. Look at verse 16. It says, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So Jesus, we see here, he's the son of David, but he's not the son of Joseph, even though Joseph named him. Because Jesus really was the son of God, and Joseph was just his stepdad. Okay? But Joseph got the privilege of raising him. Now, there's something else about that is very striking in this genealogy. I want you to, to look down through this list. And by the way, I'm going to spare you this morning. I'm not going to read every name. I encourage you to do that sometime. But as you read through this list, do you notice anything that kind of sticks out? I'll fill you in here. There are actually four women listed other than Mary. Now, why is that? especially when genealogies in those days were almost always traced through the father. And yet there are four different women that are listed here. In fact, let's take a closer look. Jump up to verse 3 of Matthew chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now, you may recall the story that Tamar dressed up like a prostitute so she could get her father-in-law to sleep with her. Hmm. Look at verse 5. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. What do we know about Rahab? She was a prostitute. And Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, who was a foreigner, a Moabitess. Look down at verse 6. It goes on to say, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. You may recall that story where Bathsheba and David produced Solomon. Now, what do we know about these women then? Two of them were harlots. Two of them were Gentiles. One was an adulteress. Now, how's that for a messianic lineage? Sounds more like a messy lineage. Hmm? We're going to take a look at this point later on. But Matthew specifically points out these four women. I want to take a look next at Luke's genealogy. And Luke's genealogy teaches us that Jesus is the son of man. He's the son of man. Would you turn to Luke chapter 3, please? Luke chapter 3, again, if you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 1463. Now, Luke was a Gentile, and he wrote his gospel <clears throat> to show that Jesus was the ultimate man. He was the perfect human. So Luke 
traces Jesus' lineage all the way back to Adam, the first human, the son of God, it says in verse 38. So Jesus is not only the son of God, he's also the son of man. He is the perfect God-man. And that's what Luke shows us here. Now, whereas Matthew began with Abraham and worked forward to Jesus, Luke works backward. Join me, please, in Luke chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 23. Luke chapter 3, verse 23. It says, now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. And then he works backward. But there's something strange here as we look at these two genealogies, because Luke's lineage is different than Matthew's. But why is that? See, uh, uh, Matthew, for example, traces the line through Solomon's son, Rehoboam, but Luke uses Solomon's son, Nathan. And then they come together again at Zerubbabel after the exile. When they come back together, both lineages uh, record Zerubbabel, but then it splits again until it comes back to Joseph. Why is that? Well, the general thought is that Matthew traces the line through Joseph, whereas Luke traces his line through Mary. Now, if that's true, what it shows here is that both Joseph and Mary are descendants of David. Jesus is absolutely qualified to be the next king. Regardless of that, as we look at these two genealogies, again, we have to ask the question, what's the big deal? What, is all of those, what do all of those names have to do with me? Why is Jesus' lineage so important? And it is very important. Why do we study this? Let me give you three very good reasons why it's important. First of all, it proves that Jesus fulfilled two covenants. It proves that Jesus fulfilled two covenants. We know that Jesus descended directly from David and therefore from Abraham. But in order for Jesus to be the Christ, he not only has to be a son of David, he has to fulfill the Davidic and Abrahamic covenant. Jump back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, please. 2 Samuel, chapter 7, if you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 436. 2 Samuel, chapter 7. We see here the covenant that God made with King David. Look at verse 12 of 2 Samuel 7. It says, when your days are over, David, and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He's speaking initially of Solomon, but look at this. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now he's talking about the Messiah. And he goes on to say, I will be his father and he will be my son. Verse 16, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So the Messiah needed to be a direct descendant of David in order to fulfill this covenant. But he also had to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. And that's why Matthew includes Abraham. Genesis 22, verse 18, the Lord says to Abraham, he says, through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So Jesus' lineage here helps us to prove that Jesus Christ, in fact, fulfilled both of these covenants. Why it's important for us to understand that. 
Secondly, Jesus' lineage proves that God can use anyone for his purposes. God can use anyone for his purposes, men and women, good, bad, and ugly, even harlots and pagans and adulteresses, God can use for his purposes. In fact, what's striking in Matthew's genealogy is that he deliberately includes less than perfect people. Michael Wilkins, in his commentary on Matthew, says this, the genuineness and the unlikeliness of this genealogy must have stunned Matthew's readers. Jesus' descendants were humans with all the foibles yet potentials of everyday people. But God worked through people such as these to bring about his plan of salvation. I don't know about you, but that gives me some great hope because we're all messed up, aren't we? We all need Jesus, and God can still use any of us. He certainly can. In fact, God didn't choose those people because they were great. He chose them because of his grace. He chooses us because of his grace. Amen? Amen. Mm. God can use anyone for his purposes, and we see that here in this lineage. But perhaps the greatest importance to us of this list of names is that it reminds us that every name is special to God. Every name is special to God. See, the Jews kept close records of their heritage for legal purposes. It was their birth certificate, their record of authenticity. But God keeps very close records of every one of us, doesn't he? I mean, let's be honest. We really don't care much about all those names on that list. Our name is not there. We can't relate. We have no idea who they are. But I want to tell you, God cares deeply for every name, including ours. Every name he cares about. And catch this, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a disciple of Christ, your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen? Amen. And the names in that book will be <clears throat> invaluable to us when Jesus returns. Hmm. Revelation 3.5 says, he who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. Mm -hmm. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20, please. Revelation chapter 20, the last book of the Bible. Let's take a look at how important our name is to God. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. John writes and he says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the book. It makes me wonder what our chapter will read like. Hmm. All of our deeds are recorded in these books. Verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So the record of names in that book will determine where we spend forever. Revelation 21 Verse 27 says, nothing impure will ever enter it, will ever enter glory, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This list of names here in Matthew 1 and Luke 3 reminds us that every name is special to God. And I know that at first glance, all of these genealogies can seem dry and boring. But just like all of Scripture, there is so much 
beneath the surface. You see now why genealogies even are important. You see why Jesus' lineage is so important. Do you see why your name is so important and why it's important that you are listed in the book of life? So the huge question is, is it? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? See, every person is special to God. Every single one of us is special to God. Every one of us has been recorded in the books. All of our deeds are being recorded in the books. The most important book is the book of life. Is your name written in the book of life? Have you repented and turned from your sins? Have you cried out to Jesus to save you, to adopt you, to write your name in his book? You see, when we take a look at this list of names, I think the important thing for us to, to walk away from this with is this. The bottom line is this. Jesus knows us all by name. He knows us all by name. Now, we may not care about all the other names listed in there, but aren't you glad that God cares about your name? And he wants you to have your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Does he know you as his redeemed and adopted child? Is your name written in the Book of Life? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I, I thank you for your word, every word of it. And yes, we admit we have no idea who most of those people are. They mean very little to us, but we know that they mean a lot to you. And we know that our names mean a lot to you. God, I, I praise you for recording our names forever in your book of life when we repent and turn to you. But Lord, I have to admit and confess, I don't know where everyone stands, you alone do. And so God, if there is anyone who is here today, anyone who's listening to this message, maybe they're not sure if they've ever given their lives to you. Maybe they haven't, they've been playing the game. Lord, if anyone's name is not yet written there, would you please speak to their heart right now? Would you please convict them of their sin, that they would confess it to you, that they would turn from their sin, that they would beg you to save them and forgive them and cleanse them. I pray that, that you would write their names, not only in your heart, but in the Lamb's Book of Life. Father, remind us again as we start this new year that we are special to you, that our names have been forever recorded by you. And Lord, we long for that day when we will see you again. And those books will be open, and we'll be able to see firsthand our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. All of that will be glory. Father, may it be so, and may you come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Remind us until that moment that we are special to you. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>